Well, welcome everybody to the Harmonic Convergence 2020. This is Dave and our theme is the universe. And I'm here with Bentin Saro and I'm excited to talk to him. How are you doing today, Bentinho? Great, thank you. <laughs> please, uh, for our audience members that uh, aren't familiar with you, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came on this path of enlightenment. Uh, man, long story, but I'll keep it real short. Um, around the age of, um, well, actually, my parents introduced me to some basic sort of meditation um, and subconscious mind control, like mind control of yourself kinds of techniques. At the age of like 10, 11, I started reading some spiritual books. And um, then I kind of forgot about it until the age of 15 or so, at which point, I gained this burning desire for uh, what at the time I called enlightenment. I still call it that sometimes, but I uh, just wanted to know the source of life, the source behind all these appearances, everything that we know. And uh, so I started off on um, quite an intense journey of just daily seeking and reading and um, went to live in India for a while, wanted to seek the source kind of of yoga in Rishikesh. And visited, you know, gurus and swamis and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, I've, at some point, I just kind of found what I was looking for. And ever since it's been deepening, and I've been sharing this message uh, for about 10 or 11 years at this point. And uh, again, super short version, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a trippy trip. Yeah, what what was it that you were looking for? Uh, the ultimate, whatever the ultimate was. Um, in, in my mind, at that point, I called it the source of everything. I realized that if I want to master any aspect of life, I first have to know the source of life. And so um, the first book I kind of came across that really was a match to the intensity of my desire for, for that freedom, for that truth, was uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which goes greatly in depth on the art of meditation, concentration, samadhi, it's not about physical posture so much. And so that kind of set me off on that sort of yoga track of enlightenment. And it, yeah, I just wanted to know the source of life, I just wanted to find a solution to sort of all the suffering and all the uh, what seemed to me to be uh, fairly misguided ideas that uh, run rampant throughout our society and just felt there is more possible that in fact, everything is possible. And that I owed it to myself. And I owed it to, in a sense, everybody to find out something really true about life and um, do my best to distill that message to synthesize those sort of um, pathways into a modern day, understandable methodology of practicing and, and realizing that which I began to realize around the age of 18. Incredible, incredible. Yeah, thank you for doing that for the <laughs> planet. We, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, so the topic uh, you chose to speak about today is the immense power of bliss. And, uh, so I want to ask you, what is bliss as you see it? Bliss is hard to describe because it's not an object, first of all. In our lives, we are so used to chasing after sense perceptions. We're so used to looking at life, we call it the world, but life is bigger than the world of what we perceive. Um, but we're so used to trying to find the truth of life, trying to find the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the source of life, enlightenment, and so forth, by looking at life through the senses at which point life is collapsed back to the world of objects, subject object relationship. I knew I had to go deeper than the intellect, I knew I had to go deeper than the senses. And then the books and scriptures that I started to study confirmed that suspicion. So I started to look beyond the senses and beyond the intellect. And I found that um, in very simple terms, perhaps, the very nature of what we are, what we're inundated with the very source of life, the very essence of all phenomena is already bliss The, if you want to put it that way, the core frequency, that's sort of behind the vibration of everything else is actually a vibration of what we 
would describe as bliss or love or peace or, or total freedom. Um, and in contrast to my suffering, as I started to practice these methods and started to dive beyond my mind, so to speak, and beyond the senses, I became acutely aware of the, of the difference between the, fo the focus that most of us spent most of our time in that brings us suffering and worry and concern and, and ill health and so forth. And between that and the focus on sort of this naturally ever present, timeless, wide open space that's always already here. That was kind of the start of my awakening, if you will, the, the beginning of finding what I was searching was the recognition that none of the objects in my existence can can satisfy this desire for truth, this desire for the source, this desire for the solution to suffering. But there is a much deeper, subtler component of my very own beingness, my very own nature that's already present, my very own consciousness, that which hears these words right now, that which is hearing this dialogue, which is witnessing this experience. And as I started to become more aware of that, naturally, a, a causeless bliss would overtake me. It's like this freedom, this explosive expanse of just like utter joy and like indescribable freedom and indestructibility and invincibility and so forth. Um, so this eternal timeless presence that's always at the root of our every experience is here. And that's what I call bliss. And it's immense in its power, because it is actually the core essential intelligence that, you know, puts earth in its orbit, and that makes everything tick and that is responsible for anything whatsoever that we are able to perceive. So bliss is in maybe those were not very simple terms, but um, it's it's the essence of what we are. And it's in essence already here. It's in truth already here, but we overlook it by focusing on the sense perceptions, and our thoughts about the sense perceptions. But there's a whole realm of existence available to us beyond our sense perceptions and beyond our descriptions of our sense perceptions. So I encourage people to find out what that is in their direct experience. And I point to it as as, as uh, letting people know that it's in truth already here. It's not something we have to become. It's just something we need to recognize. We're overlooking it as we speak. But when we become subtler in our attention, and earnest in our desire for freedom, and for the truth of life itself, not just worldly perceptions, but the source of life itself of existence itself, we kind of fall back on this principle of I exist, of I, I simply exist right here, right now. And the more we tap into that, the more this, the nature of that, which is bliss, or in India, they call it Satchitananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, uh, kind of starts to emanate into our perception, very effortlessly, it's a causeless bliss, it's not something that's produced by a cause and an effect, it's not gratifying, it is fulfillment itself. And it's already at the heart of our every experience, just, we overlook it. Mm. And how, how can you help people to, to stop overlooking this to to, to tap into this to, to experience it? Um, are there practices that you could share to guide people into experiencing bliss more often? Absolutely. Um, the primary requirement of you was the desire for it, because I teach the methods, and it really depends for some people, it lands immediately, and, they, and you get a sense of that bliss, even if it's just intuitive, even if it's just a glimpse, which is already revelatory, it's already greatly awakening, and it's already showing us that there is a different way to approach our attention, our consciousness. But even if I teach the methods, it often lends on deaf ears, because people don't have the actual interest. So yes, I can, and I can share a couple methods right now, if you want, but um, I just want to preface that by by acknowledging that what's really required is a deep interest in this. And like, I had that deep yearning, I had that urgent sort of search for it. So in my case, I embraced it wholeheartedly, these types of practices and these types of recognitions. But again, even if I were to share it right now, which I can do, um, mm -hmm. in, in many cases, we're so obsessed with our sense perceptions that we'll continue to overlook it. And we'll kind of maybe we have a short glimpse, but we'll dismiss it. Because there's so much out there that we've trained ourselves to be so fascinated by, right? 
and therefore we overlook the bliss because the bliss is super subtle it's like this there's a whisper while you're standing in a crowd uh, during a Metallica concert. And you got to learn to, you got to learn to dial into this subtlety and kind of be able to tune out your attention on the senses. Um, so with that being said, I'm, I'm happy to um, give a couple of examples of practices if you want. Yeah, that would be great. And totally understood. <laughs> cool. All right. So again, I realize then that Bliss is, before we get into its power, its power to transform the things that we do see with our senses, we got to understand that bliss is like the essence of the wave. If the wave represents the individual, again, very simplistic analogy, but it's actually very accurate as, an, as far as an analogy can go. So if we consider ourselves, our mind, body, spirit complex, our individual sense or idea of what we are, even if we boil it down to an even more service level idea, which is what most people call me, when they're referring to their person, their character, their sense of being the physical body in this physical world, right? It comes with a sense of personality with a sense of, let's call it ego. And but, so let's, let's take this individual and this represents the wave. Um, what's important to realize again, is that bliss is not something that the wave will achieve one day. It's not something that the wave is moving towards. Bliss is water in this analogy. And again, hence the word overlooking the wave overlooks the fact that it's that oceanic water. So what we want to do is we want to take our individuated spark of attention, our consciousness, that which right now is aware of my voice. So the viewers or listeners, right now have to acknowledge in a sense, or they cannot deny that they're aware of my voice. And also, they don't have to do anything for that. They don't have to think about what I say. They may not even consciously hear what I'm saying. But if they look directly at their experience, instead of thinking about it, but directly look at our current experience at your present experience, you can acknowledge that there is something there's a quality of cognizance, there's a quality of clarity, there's a quality of awareness, that effortlessly hears what I'm saying, whether or not you understand, whether or not you may agree, whether or not you're describing what I'm saying. There is something deeper than our descriptions about this moment, there's something deeper than our sense perceptions of this moment. And that deeper something has consciousness, or you could say is consciousness. So this is the first recognition is that there is a consciousness, a conscious presence an aware presence that is right now effortlessly registering whatever I'm experiencing with the senses and beyond. But most people have tuned that out, like uh, they aren't dialed to the higher frequencies, or the subtler frequencies. And so just like the radio will only channel the songs that are part of a very narrow band frequency. So too, our consciousness, our attention will only translate into sense perceptions and into conscious cognizable objects and experiences, that to which we are attuned, the frequencies to which we are attuned. But the essence of all these frequencies, what I'm suggesting here is that the essence of all of these, the root of all of these, the substratum of all of these, the background, on top of which all of these frequencies are projected, all of these possibilities of life, all of these different perceptions and thoughts, and vibrations, their very substratum, their very essence, is what we could call bliss. That's why tapping into bliss is no different than tapping into our God self, our divine nature, are already free from all these time space ideas, nature. So if we start with that, we start with the acknowledgement that right now, you, I'll just talk in terms of you as the viewer. So if, if you, the viewer right now, recognize that there's something about you, which is hearing my voice, and that that's something that's happening effortlessly, whether you try to or not try to, just to take you beyond the sense of it having to do with your sense of doership, or your sense of who you are as a mind that's focused on something. There is an awareness here that's already recognizing this moment, whether or not you're trying to focus on it. So see if you can recognize that, first of all. 
It's like recognizing the space in which all the objects arise, or the background of awareness, which is hearing my voice without you even trying. That's the first acknowledgement. It's also, in a sense, the only acknowledgement you need, but we'll take it a little deeper. So this recognition that there is an awareness that's already effortlessly present. The more we tune into that, and the easiest way to do this really is to stop describing whatever you're experiencing on your canvas, your particular window of creation that you call your life stream, if you will, your uh, collection of sense perceptions and thoughts and descriptions. What if you stopped altogether radically describing anything that you see, feel, and so forth? Just for a few seconds, you take a deep breath. And you give back to God all the ideas that you think you know so well, all the descriptions you've held on to, all the descriptions you're used to bringing up about life. And in that ease, that natural ease, you begin to sense at a very subtle level that there is indeed an ease. There is an ease of being. There is a effortless, space-like presence of awareness which is not, and this is where the bliss for most people begins to sort of come in. And the more practice, the more blissful it becomes. But you can glimpse the bliss when you, for example, recognize that that awareness, which is actually in truth you, more so than your personality is you, more so than your thoughts are you, more so than your sense perceptions are you, that stable, ever-present awareness which looked in the mirror when it was eight years old, which looked in the mirror when it was 15 years old, which looks in the mirror today, there's something timeless within you that hasn't changed. Now, if you can recognize that throughout your life, it's not only not changed, but therefore also it's not been affected. Because what are we looking for as human beings? Aren't we looking for a well-being that is invincible? Secretly, we may not term it that way, but are we not looking for a happiness that we believe is caused by something, but we hope that once it's caused, it will stay there? <laughs> but you see, that's the delusion. Happiness can never stay if it's caused, if it's triggered. If something caused the happiness, it cannot stay. The true happiness, if we want to find out true happiness, true well-being, and well-being is a word that greatly not does bliss justice, but let's just say we're looking for well-being, total, complete, holistic well-being, then the wave needs to recognize that its very nature is ocean. And the way to go about this in a very mechanical, almost scientific, practical, experiential way is to bring your attention back from descriptions, to let go of descriptions and knowledge, relative knowledge about objects and perceptions, and bring that attention back, in a sense, to the heart of oneself, the heart of being, the root essence that is required for anything else to follow. And that is often described as this feeling of I exist, or I am. It's more well known as the feeling of I am. And as you stop thinking about things, to the best of your ability for just a few seconds, in this emptiness of thought, you can recognize that you still exist. And I can't make it any simpler than this. It's about shifting from thinking to direct experience of that subtler, ever-present, stable, unaffected, timeless essence of I purely am. I purely exist, period. And to rest attention in its essence, to rest the wave back into the ocean, at some point begins to release a bliss that's not caused. Now, it may seem caused because we're doing an exercise that can allow this bliss to flow forth. However, what you'll see the more you practice is that this bliss was always the case. You just overlooked it, but you were inundated by it. You were absolutely permeated by this bliss of your true self, which right now is looking at this camera, is looking at this projection. It's noticing all the descriptions that you have of your life, the ups, the downs, everything. Even your spiritual search is already witnessed by this timeless essence of yourself. 
doesn't mean there is no relevance whatsoever to the relative journey. We can focus on that if we really want to. But if we wish to know true bliss, causeless happiness, stable joy, and so forth, true well-being, our unity, if we want to understand the unity of life, the, the oneness, the essence, the source of it, then we have to drop the wave back into the ocean. In fact, it already is, because there is no wave outside the ocean, apart from the ocean. So it's a matter of recognizing our intrinsic, ever-present oneness to be already the case. And the more purely we do that, meaning the less we distract ourselves with descriptions and the more we're able to bring attention back to the direct experience of being aware, just that. Then over, quote unquote, time, rather with practice, the layers of the mind will begin to unfold, will begin to fall away. And this awareness will show itself, this core of our essence, our beingness, the pureness of I am, will reveal itself to have no form of its own, no particular form, to have no location. It's not located in the body. It's not located inside of the world, inside of this room. It's revealed to never been affected by any of our perceptions. Just like the screen is not affected, whether the movie projects warfare or a peaceful Teletubby realm, the screen is unaffected. And this is what we're looking for, but we're trying to find it in a cause and effect based, sense perception based, intellect description based universe, and we're never going to find it. It's never going to work, in my opinion. Um, so we got to drop our attention back into the heart of being, into the source of what we are. And that bliss is so potent. It will not only relieve you of your suffering, it will also empower the true blueprint of your individuated expression, this, this intricate illusion of the mind body spirit complex, and it will activate this in a whole new way, empowering this intelligence to then share through this vehicle, the true message that it's here to bring and learn much more quickly what it is here to learn for itself. The power of bliss really is immense, and it really is uh, underestimated. Because we were always talking about fighting this, fighting that, protesting this, protesting that, accomplishing this, accomplishing that, doing this, doing that, action, action, reward, reward, cause and effect, sense perception, sense perception, saving the world, saving the world. But none of that, none of that, no matter how well intended, no matter how spiritually backed up, no matter how empowered we stand in our own two feet, in our own two shoes, and and try to save the world and try to do good and try to do this and that. It pales in comparison to the power of bliss that effortlessly, intelligently manifests through us, inspires us in certain ways. Go left. Oh, okay. Go right. Okay. Go right. Do this. Don't do this. Just rest for now. Don't do anything for three weeks. Oh, great. Okay. Now take action. Go here. Ba -ba. It's like an effortless flow. It's like being in a flow state the whole time, just by dropping attention back into the essence of what we are, contacting that causeless bliss of this free awareness that's not affected by any of these time space perceptions, getting in touch with our eternal nature, and then letting the intelligence which is blissful, operate through us more and more getting out of our own ways. And then gorgeous, amazing qualities will naturally spring forth to us, we don't have to accomplish them, we don't have to attain them, they're already intrinsic in the nature of this clarity, this spacious awareness. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And yeah, I just I see that, like, um, like, being a vehicle to self realization and enlightenment. And, and I just would like you to maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, like how how that's used as a tool to achieve these things. Bliss is enlightenment. Realization, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Bliss is enlightenment. Bliss is enlightenment because bliss is the nature of the self. So to realize oneself is again, to use a simple analogy, is like the wave recognizing that it's actually water. It's just, a, it's just a matter of recognizing the true nature of what we are instead of thinking, 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 describing, 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 believing, 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 direct experience requires no belief. An experience of objects requires beliefs and descriptions. But the direct experience of being, of existing, 
which is the requirement for us to then be able to even use the mind and go out and describe sense perception is ever present. It's only available through direct experience, direct perception, by turning attention back onto itself, excuse me, by turning awareness back onto itself, by pulling that monkey back in, if you will, of the attention and resting it in this effortless, already present cognizance of what's here. That is the road to enlightenment, or you could say that is enlightenment. Now it's just a matter of repeating that and becoming so familiar, so acquainted, so well established in that true self recognition that that self realization becomes more and more all pervasive in your experience. The bliss begins to sort of outshine the projections on the screen of the movie. The screen itself becomes apparent to itself, regardless of what's happening. And this is the birth of, ironically, causeless stability. This is when we allow ourselves to rest in this causeless stability, which is infinitely more intelligent than most people will ever allow themselves to be by thinking and doing. So it is enlightenment. Bliss is the nature of the self. It is the realization of self. Not the type, again, people should understand that it's not the it's not the bliss people say is blissful when they have a certain sense perception or when they have a certain say orgasmic experience or not that there's anything wrong with that but those are cause and effect based sensations the true bliss again is subtle it's like this whisper in a metallica concert crowd and you've got to dial into it that's why you need to desire it otherwise it'll escape you for the rest of your life and you'll continue to chase these ideas of who i am and self-realization and enlightenment but all the while missing out on this core principle, which is that pure nature of I am, which just so happens to be blissful, just so happens to be costless joy. It just so happens, as it turns out, to be actually infinite, eternal, and beyond space and time. And we can recognize this because it's what we are. It is self-realization. Bliss and self-realization are synonymous. Hmm. In your opinion, how can how can bliss be used to influence world peace? Like, how can that, how can that internally, externally, in community, uh, to bring world peace? Does every man and woman not do what they do because they're looking for this bliss, for this well-being? So, what if everyone found it from one day to the next? What if everyone discovered it to be already theirs? What if everyone suddenly knew they were sitting on his treasured chest of, of everything they ever wanted. What do you think would happen to our actions? And like we were, we need to keep fighting in order to keep fighting. So if we're talking about peace, which you could say is the opposite of war, uh, on an external level, peace on an internal level has nothing to do with peace on an external level or war on an external level. The true peace is the same as that bliss, is that costless nature. And it can be experienced right now, regardless of the state of this crazy world. But why is the world so crazy? Why does war continue in all of its facets and forms? War in families, war in communities, war in politics, war on social media, uh, actual physical war with armies and so forth. Why does it persist? It requires people to continue to do it. So even the concept of let's now use bliss and form an army of this bliss to somehow fight the non-bliss or to fight the non-light is also something that needs to be dissolved. It's also something that needs to be understood to be a futile attempt. What if everyone just stopped fighting? <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but if everyone stopped fighting, what would happen? World peace, instantly, within five seconds, within zero seconds. So it requires us to continue to play into the game of the matrix and opposition and anti antagonistic messaging and media and all that stuff. So the power to transform the world, I know it sounds so cliche, but it's so true. It's so powerful. It's so true. And it needs to be understood to not be cliche, but to be remarkable and to be desirable. And that is that the only way to change the world is to enter, to step into the bliss, into the highest state you can possibly imagine without trying to get there through your actions. Don't worry, your actions will still flow from you. People think sometimes that if we don't fight for something, if we don't fight for this, don't fight for that, 
that somehow we wouldn't be creating a better world. But nothing is farther from the truth. We're only reacting to the old systems over and over and over again. Bliss doesn't do that. The intelligence of bliss will inspire you to do nothing when it, that's the best action to take. But just as much it will inspire you to do to go to great lengths to use your body, mind, energy, to execute amazing things very courageously against all odds. But it will come from that inspiration and that intelligence, which is part and parcel of the motherboard of oneness, that all that isness, that pure state of I am. So bliss is the great peacemaker, like instantly. It has the power to transform the world, but people don't believe that because we're obsessed with this very, very, very narrow bandwidth of creation, and we call it the world. <laughs> the world is absolutely nothing compared to existence. It's just, it's gone. It's just like that. But we're so obsessed with everything that exists within this tiny portion of the illusion of the creator. And we're so focused on our sense perceptions, which science also has confirmed. We only perceive like 0 0.00 whatever spectrum of light and, and audible sounds and what have you. So even from the point of view of the world that we think is existence, which is not, it's just a tiny expression of it. We're so fixated on it because we think this is what life is, but life is not the senses. It's that too, but it's definitely not limited to it. It's a very small portion of what we are. And so by tapping into this bliss, our perspective goes boof. Now from that explosive, expansive, subtle, all-pervasive, intelligent perspective, which naturally comes with a sense of bliss, because now the emotional guidance system is letting me, us know we're in alignment with the truth, and so we feel amazing. Every time we're in alignment with truth, we'll feel blissful. And so anything that comes from us then will be turned into peace, will be turned into bliss. Because whatever we touch will take on the quality of our state of being. Absolutely. <clears throat> do, you, do you ever have any uh, challenges that, that take you out of a blissful state? And, and how do you find yourself uh, coming back to it? Um, on one hand, I could say that there are, uh, but there's a simultaneity to it. Once you've practiced this enough, the water recognition doesn't really go away anymore. So the wave after it's realized to such a deep degree that it is water no matter what, then even if the winds get choppy, you'll still have the experience of the body, in this case the wave, and the mind, in this case also the wave, being sort of slung around and like challenged here, challenged there, stretched thin over here, like blah, blah, blah. So all the, the sense perceptions and the, even the thoughts to a degree, not entirely, but to a degree, the thoughts, the mind, can also still be challenged, can still be pulled to its very edge of comfort. And so in that sense, my experience is not that different from other people, but it's just that I see that as a tiny, tiny portion, ultimately insignificant compared to the timeless nature of what I am. So there's a simultaneity to it when things do get choppy and catalytic and, and weird or challenging, if you will, on a relative level, there is a pervasive recognition of the background that shines forth. So it's it's yes and no, it's both, it's simultaneous. And therefore, it doesn't really distract me anymore. Um, in the way that you see most people are distracted, and I used to be distracted just as much. But it's just with practice, practice makes perfect. The more you practice this, the less you can unsee it, you know, and it's just so obvious. And then you trust in that you begin to trust in bliss, and then bliss begins to resolve your issues. <laughs> It's really funny, where prior to that usage of bliss by not doing anything out of ego, or at least as little as we possibly can, but kind of tapping into the bliss first and foremost, the freedom, the greater perspective, when we trust in bliss, then bliss now begins to empower through our bodies, through the wave. Now we're backed up with the essence of the entire ocean, instead of just with what's contained within the wave. Therefore, our actions and our decisions will be that much more balanced, that much more harmonious, and our actions will lead to that much more peace and true transformation. And it comes with a natural sense of courage, because you're not operating from separation, you're operating from bliss, which is connected to the motherboard of all that is. So let bliss do the talking, in a sense, let bliss do the operating, let bliss do the executing, 
if people could just trust in that state of being more and less try to do their way into happiness. Happiness is the way, happiness is the path, and happiness creates that next level civilization that we desire on a relative level. But we have to take our attention beyond just a relative focus in order to appreciate the relative focus in its proper context, be sort of naturally detached from it while deeply caring about the results on that relative level, because why not? And But it doesn't pose the same threat anymore to our existence. We've become quite fearless, more and more fearless. And from fearlessness, naturally, courageous actions follow. And from courageous actions follow, that naturally means that it's uh, typically more often than not the right action rather than a reaction or um, a biased reaction or something that I'm trying to protect myself from. So now it becomes in the benefit of all our actions more and more, the more we trust in bliss and let bliss do the talking and the doing, the more everything we do has a harmonic kind of vibration to it, a harmony to it. And then you can't help but express and be generous as you're inspired to. And everything you do turns more and more into gold, so to speak, more and more into bliss. Mm -hmm. And then you can just radiate that out into the world. Exactly. Um, I, I have a question for you. How um, how did you uh, come across uh, come up with the date twenty thirty five? Like uh, I see that that you mentioned that as kind of a, a, a point that you're aiming for. Yeah, there are a few misconceptions about that. It's not that I'm aiming for that. It's not a personal goal. It's more prediction, if anything else. Um, just a sense of a probable window of time around the year 2035, where I think we'll be able to look back and say that we have, we have changed so drastically as a civilization that we can no longer associate ourselves with the image that we have of humanity. And so I call it or have called it the enlightened, an enlightened civilization by 2035, for uh, several reasons. One, because it offers people something recognizable, something to kind of um, almost also use in a hopeful way, but as kind of a marker. And like I said, it's sort of what I sense to be a fairly accurate prediction of the time frame within which we can look back and say, we have become not a fully enlightened civilization in terms of we're all the Buddha, and we no longer have any egos, and we no longer have any mind and we're perfectly undistracted, clear, unified consciousness all the time. That's, that's not going to be 2035, most likely. It's ever possible, but it's improbable. So when I say enlightened civilization by 2035, I mean it in a more relative level, where we step up our frequency, our state of being, to be ready for that next level density, that fourth density of love, of transparency, of understanding, of compassion, of co-creation, of harmony. The vibration of harmony and transparency and love will be the norm more than we've ever known it before. And so this is my hope. It's also my prediction in a sense. And I feel that it gives people um, just a little bit something more long term or mid term to anchor or to kind of guide themselves into and align themselves to. So I felt it would have a powerful effect on a collective to have this sense loosely, not as like 2035, as a concept, but just as a general sort of marker to like, oh, lift towards and, and do our best to sort of co create and, and radiate this message into the world in that way. And then I think, if we all step up our game that 2035 will be a threshold for us. Absolutely. Um, but we're, we're, we're coming towards the end of our time. And I, I just want to ask you, is there, is there that you, you're feeling called to, to share anything else that you'd like to, to share with us um, in, this, in these last minutes that we have? Uh, just love yourselves. I mean, there's so many ideas out there. And I would just say, uh, welcome and love yourself. Go back to the bliss from where you came. Trust in that. Trust in the nature of things. Trust in the essence of yourself. Do not be fooled by the myriad of ideas that are out there right now. Do not listen to what's out there. Please don't. Please don't. It's the opposite of loving ourselves. And the only way to love is to love ourselves. 
So give yourself that break, give yourself permission to not always have to do and execute and act, but rather to be and to discover and to realize yourself, to understand that the greatest gift that we can give to this world is to recognize the truth of who we all are. Because if I recognize what I am, there's no way that I could want harm for you. There's just no way. The only way I could want any type of harm for you, whether consciously or unconsciously, is if I don't know what I am, if I don't know this unified field, if I don't know this essence of this bliss consciousness awareness that's already here looking through your eyes, already hearing through your ears, and also goes way beyond it when you dive into it. This is the solution to everything, my friends. It's what's actually listening to my voice right now. So give yourself that permission. Don't listen to human beings. They've messed up for millennia. Don't let yourself get guilt tripped into any kind of behavior or way of thinking. Just radically depart from the consensus reality understanding of what is and what should be done and what's real and what's not real. And find out for yourself what's real. Go deep within yourself. Give yourself that gift. Love yourself. The world will take care of itself through our actions, but it will take care of itself once we are aligned to the proper state of being state of being over circumstances and thoughts any day of the week over and over again. This is the commitment of the spiritual adept. This is the commitment of the shepherd who wants to make a difference. State of being, state of consciousness, over and beyond circumstances and thoughts and judgments and so forth. The actions will follow. Trust in bliss. Love yourself. Thank you for that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, your Trinfinity course? Sure. Um, seven years or so ago, I created an online course to kind of bring together the main components of my work at the time. Of course, it's evolved and become a little bit more refined over time. But uh, the essence is definitely there. It's very accessible to a lot of people. Uh, we made it entirely free. So it's an online free school, no strings attached. Um, so I encourage people to check it out. It has the empowerment course or uh, branch, and it has the self-realization or enlightenment branch, because spirituality at large can kind of be categorized as either being a form of self-actualization or self-expression or self-empowerment or self-realization or enlightenment or tracing back the nature of what we are to its essence beyond the mind and the ego. And I've been doing my best to synthesize these two categories into sort of a unified structure that supports each other, because in the end, these two paths are one. And therefore, trinfinityacademy.com. So that's infinity with a T and an R in front. So trinfinityacademy.com. Again, totally free course for people to enjoy. It's videos. Um, so yeah, check it out. If you're mostly interested in enlightenment, then I just recently did another free course which is more of an updated version, slightly more in depth and sophisticated, perhaps. And it, this is uh, can either be found on my YouTube channel or bentinomasaro.tv slash free retreat. Again, also no strings attached, just pure content, enjoy it, uh, apply it, and you will definitely experience more bliss in your life. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we still have a little bit more time. So I just want to like, uh, how do you um, like, what brings you the most bliss in your life? I, I know you um, have some some entries, um, in, including free diving. I was I was I was looking at um, how how long can you hold your breath? <laughs> cool. Uh, well, my record is five and a half minutes. Um, but I don't do that anymore, really, because uh, you have to kind of be by the ocean consistently, and if you can't practice consistently. Uh, the adaptation phase like kind of comes back and forth. And so at some point, it was just a little bit too much of a logistical hassle to continue. But I enjoy it from time to time when I'm near the water. Um, as to your first question, which is more important question in my eyes, less the, the more non transient question is, what brings me the most bliss? And again, you have to understand that bliss is what brings me the most bliss. Um, because it's not costless, it's not caused, it's a costless thing. So Truly, the most blissful thing for me is to recognize what I am. And it sounds kind of boring to people, but man, once you tap into that infinite, infinite fountain of yourself, 
everything just becomes an expression of it. And there's no more trying to get bliss from anything that you do. You're giving bliss to everything that you're doing. And yes, some things you'll prefer over other things, although they'll become less and less in, in, important as well for your well being. But so yeah, free, I could be free diving and just be like, wow, awesome. Or I could be climbing and be like, wow, awesome. But there's no there's no like, oh, I can't wait to go climbing because it gives me this amazing rush or this amazing feeling. You have to understand after so much practice of this, that bliss, which people find in their peak moments, plus so much more is available right here, right now, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. So yes, I have certain preferences because I'm navigated in certain directions, but it's more inspiration based. It's what, what feels the most vibrationally aligned. And then I go and do that. I don't really have any hobbies at this point. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done some fun stuff with my physical body. And uh, from time to time, I still do, but there's nothing that gives me bliss. Um, I am bliss. Good thing we are bliss. Yeah. Now where to get to? So perfect. <laughs>